Today, uh, as we've already said, it's uh, the day we know as Palm Sunday. And it's the day when we look specifically at that story where Jesus is riding into Jerusalem uh, on a donkey and all the crowds are waving their palms and shouting Hosanna. And uh, it's a really familiar story for us, isn't it, uh, as Christians? And it is very easy to wonder uh, how can we look at this from a new perspective or what can we hear, what can we possibly hear this morning that will sound new to us when we're so familiar with this story. But actually, the fact is that we don't need to hear anything new about it. You know, sometimes I think we can look so hard for some sort of new blinding revelation or new interpretation that actually we miss the revelation that is right in front of us. We mustn't tire of hearing stories of our faith over and over again. We mustn't tire of that because actually that's how we become firmly rooted and firmly established in our faith, by knowing the stories that our faith is founded on. Uh, Deuteronomy 11.19 says this, Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. It's basically saying, tell the stories of God over and over again. And you don't have to add anything to them. You don't have to look for any new angle. Just tell the stories over and over again. Um, You may remember me saying a few weeks ago that uh, Jewish boys by the age of 12 were expected to memorize the whole of the Torah. And the way they did that was from just hearing it over and over again through loads and loads and loads of repetition. And uh, the Exodus story is still recounted in Jewish daily prayers uh, today and still recounted at every Passover. So as Christians, we must not shy away from hearing these accounts, from hearing the accounts of the uh, events uh, that took place in the life of Jesus. We mustn't shy away from hearing them over and over again. Because after all, he is our role model He is the author and perfecter of our faith. And the more we know about him, the more we're immersed in him, in the stories, in the events of his life, the more we can be more like him. We can't be imitators of Christ if we're not constantly exposed to the stories of his life, can we? It's about learning the way, learning his way as his followers. Um, I read this week about a young lad who felt he was hearing the same old stories at church time and time again and just finding it all a bit repetitive. And so one Palm Stunt Sunday, he decides he's not going to go to church. He knows that he's not going to go. So he stayed at home. When his dad came back from church uh, holding a palm branch, uh, his dad decided to explain to him, you know, the story again. And his dad said that when Jesus came into town, everyone was waving them to honor him. And so this little boy replies, that's typical. The one Sunday I miss church and Jesus shows up. Let's not despise the beauty of revisiting the stories of our faith. Because if we take them for granted, we just never know when we might miss out. So we are reading today from John chapter 12. So please uh, get your Bibles out or your Bible apps or however you want to read it, but just do have something visual to look at because it does help it go in. John chapter 12, and we are going to start at verse 12. So John chapter 12, do feel able to stand up and grab yourself a Bible over uh, on the table there. And let's have a look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12, it begins with the words, the next day. Can I just give you some context about what had happened the previous day? So at the start of chapter 12, Jesus has gone back to Bethany and uh, 
It's described as the place where Lazarus lived. Now, Lazarus is the person that Jesus raised from the dead. That has already happened by this point. And this town, Bethany, it's also described as uh, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. So we've got Mary, Martha and Lazarus, and they are all really good friends of Jesus. And so... Um, the day, this is the day before what we think of as Palm Sunday. Jesus is at their house and a dinner is being given in his honour. And Mary takes uh, some really expensive perfume and uh, made of pure nard and she pours it on Jesus' feet and she wipes them with her hair. Now, if you remember that story, Judas, he objects saying, oh, what a waste of perfume that could have been sold and all the money uh, could have been given to the poor. And then we learn almost immediately in that passage that Judas, uh, he doesn't say this because he cares about the poor, but he says it because he actually holds the purse strings. He's kind of effectively um, the treasurer and he's putting his, his hand uh, in the money bag. So we have uh, we also have Jesus rebuking Judas and him make Jesus making a reference to um, this being his burial ointment uh, and meanwhile we've got a huge massive crowd gathering outside so this crowd uh, they've heard where Jesus is um, but not only that they've heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead are you all with me yeah that's kind of what has been happening the day before so someone's been raised from the dead that news. Can you imagine if someone was raised from the dead in Drayton? The whole of Drayton is going to know about that and beyond. Uh, that is big, big news. Um, so they want to see Jesus. They want to see the person who's done this, but they also want to see Lazarus too. So there's a lot of commotion. Things are, are really busy. They're busy anyway because of the time that it is. People are heading to Jerusalem for the Passover. So that, and there are huge crowds. There would be huge crowds anyway, but there are even bigger crowds who are seeking out Jesus because they've heard that Lazarus has been raised from the dead. They want to see Lazarus. They want to see Jesus. And how do the chief priests respond to this? Let's have a look at verse 10. In fact, could somebody read out verse 10 to me, please? Thank you. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. And as we've just heard, for an account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. So please note, they're not adding Jesus to their Jewish faith. They are going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. And because of that, the chief priests now want to kill Lazarus as well as Jesus. So we can only assume that in killing Lazarus, they are trying to remove the evidence so that people will stop believing in Jesus, stop following Jesus and stop going over to Jesus. So Jesus has been anointed at Bethany as if for burial. Remember, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to his death. And the next day, we get to his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That's what we're thinking about today, what we call Palm Sunday. So all that stuff has happened the day before. And then we get to verse 12. So the next day. So let's read on from there, from verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So the crowds go out to meet him. 
with palm branches, waving them and saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. It's quite massive things that the crowd are saying. And the use of palm branches is actually often linked to victory. And uh, we can see that in connection with the Feast of the Tabernacles in the Old Testament, where uh, God commanded the people on the first day of the feast to take um, the fruit of beautiful trees, to take branches of palm trees, um, boughs of uh, leafy trees, and also willows uh, from the brook. And God said, take all these things and rejoice before the Lord for seven days. And then they go on to, if you know the story, they make booths out of the palm tree branches that they live in, that they dwell in for uh, seven days. And all that was to commemorate uh, the way they lived after God gave them victory when he brought them out of Egypt. So there's something really significant about palm trees used in celebration and used to signify victory. They were used also to celebrate kings, and conquerors. Um, Also in um, ancient Greek athletic competitions, uh, victors were often given a palm branch that was a sign of their victory and they would wave it to celebrate their victory. There's also um, historical information in the Apocrypha which shows that a man called Judas Maccabeus is celebrated as a conquering hero by the Jews, and the way they celebrate that is with palm branches as he enters Jerusalem. So palm branches are really significant. They proclaim victory, and they proclaim a conqueror. And the word Hosanna is also really significant. And it's that word, Hosanna, that sets this incident apart from any other palm-waving event. Okay, so this is significantly different to any other palm-waving event because everybody is shouting Hosanna. So let me just talk a little bit about that word Hosanna. Uh, It's a Greek word that comes from a Hebrew phrase, um, hoshiana. And that Hebrew phrase only appears in one place in the whole of the Old Testament. And that's in Psalm 118, in verse 25. And when it appears there, it appears in the form of save, please. It is the word hosanna that's used, but it is translated as save, please. And it's a cry for God's help. And in that psalm, the cry for God's uh, help that says, save please or save now, is immediately followed by the words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there's a cry for help in Hoshiana that is answered straight away in blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So over time, this cry for help actually became a shout of hope and exhortation. It used to mean save please or save now, but it gradually came to mean salvation has come. Okay, are you are you with me? Great. So so we've got the Hoshiana, the save now, save please, and we've got the answer, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this cry for help actually came to mean salvation has come. All right. So that's just a quick recap. So picture the scene. We've got the crowds. They are gathered to see Jesus. They have heard about all these miracles. Remember, people have been uh, healed. Demons have been cast out. Uh, he's, Jesus has demonstrated his authority time and time again. He has controlled the weather. He's walked on water. Uh, he's, oh, he's done so many things. He's fed the 5,000. And now, on top of all of that, he has raised someone from the dead. So they are rushing out to meet him with huge excitement. They are lining the roads as he enters the city, greeting him with those fresh green palm branches, waving them and shouting, Hosanna. Luke's gospel tells us that they also get their cloaks and they spread their cloaks on the road. So people are praising God as Jesus uh, comes into Jerusalem. They are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's quite a scene of recognition of who Jesus is. And so 
you know, we invariably ask the question, how does it go from that to a cra- you know, crowds shouting, crucify him? How does that happen? And fir- first, in order, in order to answer that, we have to realize the implications of the praises that they're shouting. So let's just have a look at that psalm, Psalm 118. So just turn to Psalm 118, and we're going to look at it from verses 22 to 27. Psalm 118, verses 22 to 27. This is what it says. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. That's your Hosanna bit. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the light, uh, sorry, God is the Lord and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. So all this from Psalm 118, it's a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And the crowds that are shouting Hosanna as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, they are quoting this psalm. They are shouting Hosanna, save please, save now. And they are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they are shouting out the cry and they are shouting out the answer. And if you look at that psalm, it also says, the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Okay, so the builders here are the teachers of the law, the ones who should have been building God's way. You know, the Pharisees uh, who have rejected Jesus. They have rejected him, but he has become the chief cornerstone. He's become the one that the whole building depends on. Um, in biblical times, the cornerstone was used as a foundation and it was a standard upon which uh, the building was constructed. So when the cornerstone was in place, the rest of the building would conform to the angles and to the size of the cornerstone. So the cornerstone uh, uh, was really, really important. So what else have we got in this psalm? Um, Verse 24 It says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, we often quote that, don't we? We often say that verse and we say it as, uh, you know, a thankfulness for the day that we're actually living in. We, you know, we say, oh, this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we are all often saying it meaning today. But actually, this is a prophetic reference to the day when the Messiah comes riding into Jerusalem. And it's followed in verse 25 by the save now. That's the, that's the Hosanna. Are you, I know I'm going covering quite a lot. Are you keeping up with me? Yeah. So this is the day the Lord has made. It's a, it's a prophetic reference to that day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And the Pharisees are troubled because they know these things. The, the phrases used in all this adulation of Jesus are so significant. This, the Hosanna, the Saver, salvation has come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's all really significant because it's actually, it's the welcome that has been reserved for Israel's Savior. So this is really significant. This launches the day of salvation. This launches the Um, anticipated deliverance that Israel's waited for for so, so long. It's not just a general proclamation of praise. It's not just a very general Hosanna, God is good. It's really specific. It's really specific to the Messiah of God. It's specific to the one who is going to come and rescue his people. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's quoting Psalm 118. And so by shouting this out, this crowd are declaring Jesus to be the Messiah. And the Pharisees know this. 
it's really disturbing for them. Uh, In Luke's version, chapter 19, verse 39, it says this, Then some of the Pharisees in the crowd spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, command your disciples to be quiet. They're not asking Jesus to do this because his disciples are making too much noise and they're too loud. They're asking him to do it because the disciples, all these followers, all these people in this crowd are shouting out declarations that Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 40 of that passage, Jesus answers, I I tell you that if they keep quiet, the stones themselves will start shouting. This is all uh, prophecy being fulfilled. So let's have a look at the prophecy uh, in verse 15. Okay, so uh, it's from Zechariah 9.9. It says this, uh, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Everything about this day has been prophesied. Everything, even Jesus coming, riding on a donkey. So there must have been huge excitement in the air. Salvation has come. The Messiah is here. And notice that Jesus doesn't stop their declarations. This is an appointed time. This is a time foretold in all those passages I've read out. This is an appointed time. And Jesus doesn't say, no, no, don't say anything yet. No, no, shh, stop. He lets them make these declarations about who he is. But as we know, it all turns a bit sour because he's not the sort of Messiah they had expected. And he is not the sort of Messiah that they will accept. They wanted a Messiah who was going to storm uh, Rome, who was going to overturn Rome, overthrow uh, the Roman occupation. They wanted a Messiah that was going to free them from oppression. And so I imagine they were expecting that this was going to involve some sort of uprising, some sort of force. You know, Jesus does have a massive following by this point. Thousands of people are gathering to hear him wherever he goes. You know, if you think back to uh, the feeding of the 5,000, remember with um, women and children, there could have been as many as 15,000 people there. And if you remember, before he takes uh, the loaves and fish, uh, Mark's gospel tells us that he asks his disciples to get everybody to sit down in groups of uh, 50 and 100. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? I wonder how that would have appeared to uh, the Pharisees and the Roman authorities. You know, to onlookers, that, that could have had the appearance that Jesus was forming an army. You know, regrouping his troops, groups of 50 and groups of 100. So perhaps there is hope that at some point he's going to exchange the donkey for a war horse. Perhaps they think that is going to happen as soon as he gets off the donkey. The problem with this day when he was greeted with palms and when he was welcomed as the Messiah, was that in the hearts of those shouting, save us, there's an expectation of what that would look like. That to them would involve being saved from the Romans, the way their Israelite ancestors were saved from the Egyptians. Only this time Rome would be completely expelled. But instead... What they got by Friday morning was a man bloodied and beaten, held in Roman custody and not uttering a word. And definitely not looking very much like a conqueror or a deliverer. 
So when Jesus is accused, when he's brought before Pilate, the crowd are angry and they want rid of him. I suppose in their minds, Jesus didn't do what they wanted him to. Yes, he'd raised someone from the dead, but he didn't defeat the Romans and send them packing. Yes, he had healed all kinds of diseases, but he didn't dissolve the unfair tax system. And yes, he had demonstrated authority, but he didn't put the people in charge of their own government. There was no battle uh, which overthrew Rome. Rome was still in place. And there was no swapping the donkey for a stallion. They had failed to understand that he, he wasn't coming to give them what they wanted. He was coming to give them what they needed. He came to Jerusalem to save his people. But not to save them from Rome to save them from their sin, to bring them freedom from sin. The Son of God had come to bring them their ultimate freedom. And he'd come with his promise that if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Whatever the circumstances, whatever the external pressures, whether Rome's in power or not, And so in blindness and disappointment that they hadn't got the result that they wanted, shouts of Hosanna just in a matter of a few short days turned to crucify him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord turns to not this man but Barabbas. When they were shouting Hosanna, They were saying all the right things. They really were. But it was lip service. Their hearts didn't get it because their motivation was about what they wanted. And when we make our relationship with God about what we want, we are never really going to get it. We're never going to see the bigger picture because that's living our way, not his way. And the Christian walk is not about self. It's about service. Serving God and serving one another. Our faith cannot be self-centered and about what we want. It has to be Christ-centered and about what he wants. When Jesus uh, rode into Jerusalem, Luke uh, 19.41 says, He came closer to the city, and when he saw it, he wept over it, saying, If you only knew today what is needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. I just want to read you. A a Palm Sunday devotion that follows on from that point where Jesus says, if you only knew today what is needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. Um, It's a devotion by someone called Helen Painter, uh, who's the director of uh, CSBV. And uh, it, it goes like this. It's just extract from it. So in what way does Jerusalem fail? What is it not recognizing? The fundamental problem, evidently, is Jerusalem's failure to recognize Jesus. Their failure to notice when God showed up in the manner promised, though not in the manner that they expected or wanted. This was a rejection of the one whose birth was heralded with the words, peace to all on whom God's favor rests. The one who had taught and lived the way of love and peacemaking. The one whom the Old Testament prophet had acclaimed the Prince of Peace. And despite the appearance of welcome on that Sunday, they would soon take violent steps to snuff him out. Jerusalem as a whole had failed to recognize the time of their visitation from God. They had failed to recognize the things that make for peace. 
They had embraced the ways of violence and violence had come upon them. This is primarily a failure of leadership. It's upon the spiritual and civic leaders, the Sanhedrin, that the responsibility lies most heavily. These men are able to set the spiritual tone of the community. They have the power to suppress some voices and privilege others. They are the ones who have the ear of the Roman governor. And this week will prove to be the culmination of all the choices they have made so destructively in past years. They will spend the week carrying Jesus, following him, trying to trap him or trick him. And at the end of it, they will choose the way of death and will murder the Lord of life. They will duck and dive to protect their vested interests. They will collude with the occupying powers to suppress the voice of the prophet. They will do a deal with the devil and the city as a whole will pay for it. And theirs is a structural systemic failure. This is not a cheap theology of tit-for-tat divine judgment. There is something rotten at the core of the city of the nation and Malachi foresaw it. And then it uh, brings in a quote. Who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift to bear witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired workers in their wages, the widow and the orphan, against those who thrust aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. The rottenness has eaten its way into the very walls of their society. Rome is within. It affects their treatment of the poor and the weak. And it affects their worship. Of course it affects their worship. The temple has become a place of petty dishonesty rather than a place where the holiness of God is manifest. It has become a place of personal enrichment rather than a place of corporate devotion. It has become a place of noise and clutter rather than a place where people from all nations could come to worship. And the Jesus who tenderly weeps over the coming affliction of Jerusalem is also the Jesus who rages at the corruption of the temple. The one who, to paraphrase Malachi, burns like the fire of a blast furnace. Behold your king, lowly and meek and riding on a donkey. And who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Zeal for God's house has consumed him. O Jerusalem, if only you knew the things that made for peace. For the one who rages in the temple is also the one who weeps over the city. The one who disrupts our complacency is the one who provides its remedy. The one who lays bare the complexity of innocence and guilt is also the innocent one who will die for the guilty. The one in whom there is nothing of Rome is also the one who will die for Rome as well as for Jerusalem. Hosanna, Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Behold your righteous king and your salvation. And that's the uh, end of the quote from that devotion. The crowds on that very first Palm Sunday, they were saying the right things, but they missed it. They totally missed it. And my plea for us all this morning, myself included, absolutely, is that we don't miss the things of God, because we're focused on ourselves or we're focused on the way we want things or the way we expect things to happen. The crowds welcomed a Messiah, but they didn't see God because their hearts were corrupted by what they wanted, by their own desires. We need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We need to keep our eyes fixed on his way because he is the way and he is the only one who can give us true inner peace and security. We've got some palm crosses today. Um, 
which I think I'm going to pass around. Um, so you don't have to take one. It's just a symbol. It's it's just a symbol. But if you'd like to, Paddy, could you just pass them along, please? Uh, if you'd like to take one, if symbols work for you, then please, please do uh, take one just as a visual aid to remind you of some of the important things about this day. And some of the things that you can use this for as a reminder is that when Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem, he was welcomed as the Messiah. He was welcomed as the Messiah, as the Holy One, the Anointed One of God. And these palms were being waved. These palms were uh, welcoming him with the words Hosanna, which recognized very specifically that he was the Messiah. These palms, these symbols of victory and triumph. And it's in the shape of a cross. So when you look at it, remind yourself that he was triumphant over death on a cross. He was triumphant over death on a cross. You may or may know, not know that traditionally um, unused palms are burnt up uh, into ash that becomes the ash for the following year's Ash Wednesday. And so there's so many things that actually you can remind yourself of when you look at this. Remind yourself that your sins have been taken care of. They've been taken care of by the victorious, triumphant Messiah who conquered death on the cross so that you could have life. And your peace is found in him and only him. So when you look at that, think of those things. Your sin is taken care of by a victorious, triumphant Messiah who conquered death on the cross so that you could have life and peace. And your peace is found in him and only him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We want to be the people that shout Hosanna but understand its full meaning. We don't want to be the people that turn around and walk the other way. God, would you help us? Holy Spirit, would you increase in us our understanding of all that Jesus has done for us, of all that he has conquered so that we can be free. May we know that he is the source of peace, that our peace is found in him and only in him. We cannot find peace anywhere else on this earth. Please write your truth on our hearts. May each one of us have something we're going to take home from today and that we're going to remember and that we're going to apply and we ask this in Jesus name Amen